In this fascinating journey through history, I will take you to explore the most intriguing and lesser known corners of the company image line. Get ready to immerse yourself in a narrative full of unexpected twists, from games and lawsuits to scandals and the brilliance of a visionary individual. All of this converges in the creation of a program that would not only transform the music industry, but redefine it forever. Are you ready to uncover the secrets behind this unconventional story? Then join me as we delve into this exciting tale together. We travel back to the year 1994, when two young men named Jean-Marie Canny and Frank Von Beeson created Fruity Loops. Both were approximately 25 years old. Although they had nothing to do with music at the time, their sole objective was to make video games. Both were tired of developing programs for accounting or stock trading. And at that time, with releases like the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation 1, they thought it would be a good idea to venture into the world of video games, but on computers instead of home consoles. However, their first game was not what you would expect. It was Porntress, an adult version of Tetris released in 1992, two years before they officially consolidated as ImageLine. The game was basically the same as Tetris, with the small difference that in the background where the pieces were placed, there were images of naked women. And on one side of the screen, animated GIFs of people doing the famous Fruity Fantastic would appear as you completed rows. In fact, the game is still available if you want to play it. I'll leave the link in the description in case you want to play it. Image Line made a couple more games, but it was in 1996 when things began to take an interesting turn. IBM organized the Da Vinci contest for software developers with different categories, in which they participated and won the multimedia category but lost the global prize against a young, crazy genius from France, a nerd named Didier Dombrand, better known as Goal. Didier won the video game category and the global prize. Immediately, Gene and Frank recognized Goal's talent and contacted him to offer him a job at ImageLine, which he accepted. The first game they developed together was Private Investigator, a video game where you control a private investigator to solve cases, beat up gangsters, and have fun with pixelated women. The three of them continued to release a couple more games, but in 1997, Goal started working in his spare time on a secret project inspired by the Rebert 338. He developed a small drum machine application, that is, to create sequences and drum beats quickly and easily. This little humble program was called Fruity Loops. Goal showed the program to the founders, but they had doubts because it had nothing to do with their existing products. Even so, after thinking about it, they decided to release it as a free demo in December 1997, along with one of their games. And what happened? Well, the program began to be so popular that ImageLine's servers collapsed due to the number of downloads people were making. The demo was a success because its interface and way of handling it were very similar to some PlayStation video games like Music Creator or Music 2000, with the difference that you were not restricted to the loops or preloaded sounds in the game, but you could do much more. Gene and Frank realized they had something interesting on their hands. It was at that moment that the policy of free lifetime updates was born, but they needed money soon to be able to pay for the servers and development. So they asked Goal to create a clone of the EJ program, which they called Fruity Tracks, to be able to sell it to amateurs, the toy manufacturer. As a curious fact, the famous FL Studio logo is a fruit that doesn't exist. The original concept was developed by Goal as a combination of a strawberry and a mango. However, by pure chance, it ended up looking a lot like a Japanese fruit called kaki, or persimmon in English. But things were not so simple. Despite the demo having many downloads, there were very few people who were actually paying for the full version. In fact, during the first years of the program's existence, they were several times on the verge of bankruptcy. But their biggest problem was still to come. The name Fruity Loops was not considered serious at all. First, because the word fruity didn't have much to do with music. And secondly, the word loops was misunderstood because it seemed that the program could only work with pre-made loops instead of creating your own compositions. But the most important thing was that the name was too similar to Fruit Loops, a famous cereal from the Kellogg Company. Kellogg's threatened to sue Mellon for plagiarism, even though although the name was similar, the products were actually completely different. And Mellon knew they could win the case because in Europe, they had already been granted the name only America was missing. But being such a small company, they didn't have the time or the money to endure a trial that could easily last for years. So they decided to change the name from Fruity Loops to FL Studio in 2003. 
with the release of the fourth version. By this point, the humble step sequencer for creating drum beats was becoming a complete program for creating music, and it continued to grow by leaps and bounds every year. Downloads increased, and fortunately, so did purchases. But along with this, scandals also came. One of the most notorious was in 2007, when rapper Soulja Boy confessed to creating his hit Crank That using a demo version of FL Studio 6. The song generated him millions of dollars, but he hadn't paid for the program. So technically he had no rights to that song and the entire album he made with the demo version of FL Studio. Despite this, it cannot be denied that FL Studio gave many producers and rappers the opportunity to start their careers with a very accessible and powerful program in an industry where before you couldn't get in if you didn't have a contract with a major record label. The program continued to gain popularity and many more downloads, even though industry professionals only saw it as a toy for children. They said FL Studio was not a serious or professional program. But to keep FL Studio evolving, the crazy genius behind all this, Goal, continued to work tirelessly. However, difficulties would arise soon. Goal had a very particular vision of FL Studio. It was precisely his creativity that shaped that interface so different from other music production programs. He conceived it as a type of video game, and that's why it was so appealing to many. But Goal had a problem. Like any good crazy genius, he was somewhat eccentric and unpredictable. Sometimes stubborn, sometimes obsessed, and that led to conflicts. For example, in the FL Studio forum, he used to respond sarcastically or even rudely to customers and suggestions for features they gave him. He also had problems with the founders who wanted to take FL Studio in another direction, such as having compatibility with Mac. But Goal often did what he wanted instead of following the instructions he received. It was as if his opinion was the only one that mattered to him. FL Studio was his passion, more than a business. But unfortunately, if FL Studio didn't start developing the features it needed in the future, it couldn't continue to develop it either. This is because, despite having increasingly more sales, development was still being subsidized by the other businesses and programs ImageLine had. In reality, Florida Studio still didn't generate enough profits. Additionally, up to that point, Goal worked practically alone in programming and didn't want help. He didn't like working with other programmers. So there were only two possibilities. Either he adapted or he left. In 2015, after 20 years of intense work day and night, Goal decided to leave ImageLine. The main reason was that he didn't want to get involved in adapting FL Studio to Mac, as that meant reviewing more than 10 million lines of code. The other reason is that he wanted to dedicate himself again to video games and Lego model design. But he will definitely always be remembered for leaving us gems like Citrus or Harmer, synthesizers that are still considered among the most powerful on the market today. In addition to his dedication to FL Studio, ImageLine had to hire 10 new programmers just to replace what Goal was doing. But thanks to that, they also managed, after reviewing all those millions of lines of code, to release the native version of FL Studio for Mac. It's the same reason why, from that date on, Florida Studio updates began to be more frequent and increasingly larger, becoming one of the most popular and powerful music production programs today. In conclusion, the history of FL Studio, from its humble beginnings as a secret project to becoming one of the most influential programs in the music industry, is a testimony to the power of innovation and passion. Over the years, Florida Studio has challenged conventions and redefined the way music is made, offering artists of all levels an accessible and powerful tool to express their creativity. If you found this fascinating story interesting and want to continue learning about music and technology, don't forget to subscribe and share this video with your friends.